Thank you all for coming. My name is Len Schustek. I'm a volunteer with the Computer Museum History Center. For those of you who don't know, the Computer Museum History Center opened about a year ago in this area. We're an offshoot of the Computer Museum in Boston, and our mission is to preserve and study and celebrate the history of computers and computer technology. <coughs> and eventually, we're going to be opening an adults-oriented museum somewhere in Silicon Valley. We don't know exactly where yet. In the meantime, we have offices over at Moffett Field, the ex-Naval Air Station, uh, you can see from the freeway. We have, but more importantly, we have a warehouse over at Moffett Field where we're collecting tons and tons of old computers. Um, since we don't have a museum yet, we're doing a bunch of intermediate activities, one of which is this uh, lecture series, of which this is one. Um, and the next lecture will be, in fact, over in our warehouse. We have some information on it here if you want to come up later, but it is June 24th at 5.30 at the Computer Museum Warehouse at Moffett Field, and that will be a talk by NASA engineers on the ILLIAC-4. And in fact, we have some pieces of the ILLIAC-4, not the entire thing, because it would fill up our warehouse uh, <laughs> over there. Um, we also have various toys. Gwen, do you want to talk about the items we have here? Gwen Bell is the soul of the Computer Museum and uh, the gu our guiding light. and. Uh, she can talk about some of the toys we have here today. Uh, but the other thing I want to say is to come to Moffett Field, you have to be badged in. And to be efficient about that, send uh, email to allison at tcm.org. And Zoe Allison will make sure that your name is there at the gate so that you can get in as efficiently as you can. Uh, and uh, we, we, anyway. That's what you have to do for that. Uh, we do have products. Uh, we did develop a product here uh, last fall. We spent most of last fall uh, doing this work to determine all of the microprocessors that were ever done. And this is a poster of them at uh, four times scale. So all, all of them are in scale. It has been corrected a number of times. We still. But you know, someone will tell us something else is wrong with it sometime. Every edition will be recorrected. Right. So uh, it's we have order forms for it. We have we also have videotapes that we've had lectures since 1979, and uh, this is on the pioneer computers and computer pioneers. In the first three years, we had Grace Hopper and George Dibbett and John Atnasoff a number of people who are no longer with us. And so we've put this together and taken the high points off into a series of two tapes. Uh, and here you can see, here Grace herself telling the bug story. And it's much better than anybody else. And uh, you know that's, that's the way to have it. So we have order forms. This is another poster we have, which is uh, on memories and uh, was done all of the kinds of memory devices we have in the collection. And a bowl, the official Computer Bowl trivia book. Because every year we do the Computer Bowl. We won't have another one until April. But uh, we will do that again. And there's an order form. Uh, and thank you very much. And now on with the. Thank you. We're a privilege today to have two people who really are pioneers, certainly from the early days of computers, but from the very beginning days of higher level languages for computers. And they're going to talk to us today about the first COBOL compilers that were, was done in, were done in the late 50s, early 60s time frame. We have two speakers today. Let me introduce our second speaker first, Howard Bromberg, who was one of the original authors of COBOL as a representative on the original Codicil Committee from 1959 to 1962. And then he was the first chairman of the ANSI Standards Committee for COBOL. He worked on the compiler for the RCA 501 for COBOL at the same time that the UNIVAC compiler was in process. After that, he was founder and president of International Computer Technology Corporation in San Francisco, which does software development and was a consulting forum. Uh, they did design and development of commercial applications, COBOL compilers, and custom programming. Howard's been active in the ACM for many years, including a stint as a national lecturer for the ACM. He's a fellow of the British Computer Society uh, and was the chief US delegate to the ISO Committee on Programming Language Standardization. He's currently a computer industry consultant. And uh, Howard will speak second. Our first speaker is 
Harold Lawson, otherwise known as Bud Lawson, um, who was assistant programmer for Remington Rand, uh, UNIVAC, uh, starting in 1959. And he worked on the other COBOL compiler that was in progress at the same time, uh, working under Grace Hopper. And he'll tell us about the compiler and, the, uh, and, and what it was like working for Grace and, uh, in this process. After that, he worked for IBM. He was director of programming um, research and development at the Standard Computer Corporation, had a number of university positions, a uh, visiting professor or professor at Brooklyn Poly, UC Irvine, University of Stuttgart, Royal Institute of Technology at, in Stockholm, Polytechnic University of Barcelona, and Linköping University. Do I pronounce that right? Linköping? <laughs> He's also been an ACM national and overseas lecturer, a fellow of the IEEE, and since 1988 has been the managing director of his own consulting firm, Lawson Consult. It's a great privilege for me to introduce Bud Lawson because when I was a student at Brooklyn Poly in the late 60s, he was my professor and was the person who was instrumental in convincing me that computers were a lot more fun than physics. And I said, switch from being a physics major to being a computer science major, which was a, a switch I, I never came to regret. So I'd like to introduce Bud Lawson for the first part of the talk. Well, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here and to be able to share with you some of these experiences from the early days, and particularly that uh, you see that your former students have succeeded as well as Len has done. <laughs> That's always quite a, a, a great kick also. Um, in any event, um, I want to speak to you about the uh, first UNIVAC COBOL compiler today. And, um, well, as Len said, I happen to be living in Sweden at the moment. I've been there for about, well, since 1971, so that's a long time. But that's another story. I won't say why, but <laughs> in any event. I went there to design a machine for a Swedish computer manufacturer and never got away. <laughs> okay. Uh, and anyhow, but anyhow, some of the early days of computing. I started my uh, career, as was mentioned, at, uh, in the Philadelphia area as well as a large part of Howard's time was also there. So I'd like to dedicate this to, uh, to our common f former boss, Grace Murray Hopper. She was a great inventor, a great teacher, and she was always questioning things. And she always inspired people in many ways that I think were important. And uh, all of us who grew up in Aunt Grace's boudoir are eternally grateful. And, the, and this word boudoir, I think, is very interesting because her broche who was a very controversial figure, I guess he's still around <laughs> somewhere, um, in an article in Date the Nation uh, in the about time frame 60, 61, called the Automatic Programming Department at UNIVAC, Ant Grace's Boudoir. So I thought that would be interesting to cite that point. So, and anyhow. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> what I'd like to speak about today is to give you a little introduction talk about some of these early UNIVAC languages and compilers a little bit before the uh, time of COBOL, just to give you a little framework as to what happened in advance. It's not a complete history. Talk to you a little bit about the characteristics of the UNIVAC II, uh, so you get an appreciation for the extreme resource limitations that one was dealing with in designing a compiler for a language of the size of COBOL at that point in time. Um, then I would like to talk a little bit about the strategy of how one will look at Grace, look at compilers, uh, which developed kind of, kind of a, a way of looking at compilers from about the time Howard came there in, the, in about 55 or 56, and was used as the, a philosophy of how one developed the uh, uh, UNIVAC II COBOL compiler, looking at it as a data processing system. Uh, and that has some interesting implications. But then I'll talk about and go through the actual compiler structure. Uh, a little bit. And then I'll look at one of the heaviest parts of the, the compiler, the code generation part, which I had the responsibility for doing, which we happen to call does. When remember the old soap commercial, does does everything. <laughs> and that's how it got its name. And uh, it was uh, quite a challenge to get that to fit into the UNIVAC 2's memory, but I'll tell you about that. And then I'll surprise you all to tell you that this was probably the world's first compiler written in a higher level language, which means strange for such a small machine, but the compiler was actually written in Flowmatic. 
which was a previous higher level language. Uh, very interesting. <coughs> now, I left uh, uh, Temple University in June of 1959 and started to work for Grace there. And there was an interesting point in time. It was an old Exide battery warehouse on 19th and Allegheny Avenue, dusty and dirty with the railroad tracks running down the backside. And that's where Howie was also. And um, I remember showing up there on the first day of, of work, getting a pile of hardware and software manuals and an assignment to, to build a new generator for the Flowmatic compiler. And if you imagine, I knew a bit about computing. I'd taken some programming courses at the, the year before at the United Census State Census Bureau uh, in Washington. And uh, so anyhow, but that was quite a challenge. <laughs> and you have this kind of sink or swim attitude about, uh, well, learn it and do it. And we learned a lot by doing it, but we had also a lot of fun colleagues there that, that helped to, to get that. So, but after this was the important time of, that the COBOL compiler was being developed, so after getting this training, it was, of course, put on this team to, to develop the COBOL compiler. There were uh, four really senior designers that worked for Grace directly, and that were, they were uh, Bill Finley, Tom Jones, Dan Goldstein, and Dick Miner. These were my bosses, basically, uh, and did the really uh, high-level systems analysis and design of the compiler from Grace's higher-level ideas. And uh, then we were a number of people, which I've cited. I, I've, I've actually written a preliminary paper that everybody can get a copy of here, and which I hope will appear in the Annals of the History of Computing within the next period of time also. So uh, I'll, I'll, it will contain this and probably some, some other things also. So that was that was my start in the in the uh, in the in the in the business there. Now there were some earlier work that were done, and a lot of uh, programming language and compiler history, a fair amount of it uh, actually is attributed to the work that went on at uh, at Univac and with Grace. Um, her first compiler, which I have a documentation for myself, was A0 that uh, was done in about 51, 52 time frame. And I think probably, I'm not sure, but this is maybe one of the first papers that the word compiler ever appeared in. Uh, when no Don Knuth is sitting over there, he might agree with that. And no, I agree. I, I was just going to say. It was, it was not what we would call a compiler. It was a way of collecting together a set of subroutines that evaluated mathematical and statistical functions. Uh, so it had some type of little control mechanism for bringing things from a tape library and putting them together and doing that thing. But OK, compiling is the thing of putting things together, so in that regard. Uh, but from, from those humble beginnings, <laughs> uh, Grace went further and uh, eventually evolved a language called Mathematic, which looked much more like what we would call language in a compiler. Uh, and Mathematic, at was least, was a paralleled, or maybe before, or in the same time frame of Fortran, uh, was available in the UNIVAC, UNIVAC 1. Um, in um, <coughs> about 1955, then uh, Gase was interesting turning her attention to a, uh, to a type of compiler for dealing with data processing, which was being, becoming the predominant use of computers uh, at the time. And uh, so I have here a document that uh, was produced on a um, preliminary definition of a data processing compiler, which is stamped February 3, 1955. And that was the origin of the B0 effort in about the same time frame that uh, Howard joined uh, UNIVAC. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, I could other side of that, uh, there's an example of a program that's very close to Flowmatic written in the last three pages. And it's, there's this English version, a French version, and a German version of the program. So she thought that it was important at that time that things would be written in, their, in your own language that you would express this in. That hasn't turned out to be the case. But it was interesting that at that point in time, her point of view was exactly that. Uh, in any event, uh, Flowmatic. Uh, took hold actually within the UNIVAC world, became a very important compiler. A lot of people did a lot of important work with Flowmatic. Uh, there were implementations even done and in the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to, do, to use Flowmatic to generate code not only for the UNIVAC 
uh, one and two, but also to generate code for an IBM 705. Uh, so you could compile code actually for producing 705 assembly code and assemble it from uh, from Flowmatic. This was called the Amico system. Uh, <clears throat> now Flowmatic became an important influence, one of the important influence, along with Comtran from IBM and uh, some of other languages that became inputs to the CODASL effort. That Howard, I think, will give you much more deeper insight than I, I can give you. He was really a key person in that whole activity. I, being a junior programmer at UNIVAC, only heard these fantastic his historical aspects about histories about Gene Samet and about other people <laughs> that were working on this uh, CODASL committee at the time. And, uh, but uh, but uh, it was uh, interesting to learn about that. OK. So those are some of the earlier parts. Um, i just give you a few characteristics of the UNIVAC II, which give you a little, I think, of a picture of what that was. Uh, looking at. Here's, a, here's kind of a, a view of the configuration of the UNIVAC II. Large central processing unit and memory with a water-cooled system was the first use of a, uh, one of the early uses of core memory. The UNIVAC-1 had a Mercury delay mine memory with 1K words. And a word in the UNIVAC-1 and 2 was uh, represented in character forms, six-bit binary code of decimal. And the, the, the decimal part was so-called XS3 decimal uh, for various reasons. But it was really a true decimal machine, 12 decimal digits, 12, 12 characters to word. All arithmetic was performed in decimal. Um, you dealt with input-output on these uh, uniservos, tape drives. You could have, I think, up to 10 of them. If you were fortunate, five or six worked <laughs> at a time. <laughs> um, you had uh, a supervisor control panel, which was much like flying an airplane. <laughs> and uh, you learned to listen to programs as well as to observe the lights and see what things were going on. And you could really do a lot of debugging by these visual visual uh, and, uh, and here and uh, uh, aspects of, of, of dealing with your, your program. There were a lot of uh, some peripheral equipment, which were things were done offline with. How many words of code? 2K in the UNIVAC 2 of 12K words, and 1K in the UNIVAC 1. Okay. Now, um, the character set as it had 64 characters said, and here we see these, uh, the numeric, uh, the alpha uh, digits were there, and that they built an XS3 because you see that they don't start at the, up until this point, so the actual binary code uh, at this point, 3, will be equivalent with 0. <laughs> okay. But that's the, what, why it's called XS3, binary code of decimal. Now, uh, I didn't have as, uh, an instruction card left, but I, did, I do have a UNIVAC to data processing manual, and so I found this instruction list. This is, this is all the non-input-output instructions okay, for the whole machine. Now, the machine basically was very easy to learn to program in assembly language, strangely enough, because all of these things like A is add, and S is subtract, and M is multiply, and D is divide. And after a while, they became very intuitive because it was decimal, only reference decimal addresses, you reference everything was decimal. Well, it's not very difficult to program in machine language. There was an assembler called X1, which was did very minimal things, and you could get assembly code stuff uh, done like that. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a rather simple machine to learn to program. I think we, we, can, we can put that in context with what, what has happened and where we are today. And one would say that this gives us something to think about in respect to our current world of complex software systems based upon more primitive instruction sets provided by the contemporary microprocessors we saw on the, <laughs> on the view here, okay? I mean, we, uh, have we made progress in this area? One could really question that. Uh, having uh, microprocessors which were, uh, had an instruction set like uh, we're dealing with x86 uh, doesn't really make our, for software-friendly systems. Uh, this was the UNIVAC 2 was, I think, a software-friendly computer. <laughs> okay. So, interesting thought to think about. I give that as an aside here. Um, so, that's a little bit about the UNIVAC 2. 
Uh, I don't. I could say a lot more about it, but uh, I think it give you a feel for some of the flavor of, of the Inovec two. Uh, instructions were there were two words, two instructions per word, a left half and a right half, uh, six digits per instruction, and um, well, it, as I said, it was fairly straightforward to learn the program. Um, now, compilers are data processing systems. Well. The, the idea of building a compiler for these machines that would um, uh, uh, be able to deal with a language like Flowmatic or eventually like COBOL, etc., and even right at the beginning when Grace did this experimentation in 55 with what we call B0, uh, you see this data processing type of thinking. We've got to make a lot of tapes because we didn't have much memory to deal with, right? So you couldn't keep too much program or too much of the program that you're compiling in, in memory at one point in time. So you had to look at it as a data processing system. And at UNIVAC, data processing systems of the day were something like the following. Here we have the, these uh, UNISERVOs where you mounted up <coughs> live uh, tapes. And this is for a typical in type of data processing system. You have an inventory tape and an updated inventory tape where you pass transactions against that and do an updating. So that, that type of thinking permeates also the compiler because here, this, in this case, the source document, this is source code written in COBOL. And you actually type this on a unit typer. And that's recorded onto a, a, a tape uh, conversion here. And then uh, you mount that and start up the compiler and, and run it here. So it's, it runs very much like that. Now, the, the on input output system also was, was quite simple, basically. Uh, everything was read in 60 word blocks. So there was nothing else. That was the only way you could get stuff in and out of these 12, 12 uh, uh, character words. And uh, there were there was con uh, conventions to indicate end of file, end of volume, end of file, etc. In the in the beginnings of these blocks, which are called sentinels, uh, that would uh, allow you to deal with the uh, treatment of these tapes. I, I bring this up to show you that we really want to look at the compiler now as a data processing system. Now, in retrospect, if I, you know, knowing what I know about compilers today, I probably would not have done it that way at the, at the time, okay? And, uh, and, and since he's here, I, I just I want to remember, because the first time I ever heard the word Don Knuth was in about 1960. Um, and I had heard that you had done a compiler in, when you were at Case. Okay, it was about the time we were working on this, and we said, wow, this, this system was so complicated uh, about how we will build compilers. And I know that you had done the one by yourself, so it seemed to us a rather interesting challenge that such a person could write one com uh, compiler by himself. And, uh, but eventually, of course, I met you, so I couldn't understand how you did that work <laughs> at that point in time. <laughs> so, anyhow. So it was the first time I heard your name, Don, anyhow. <laughs> else what you're doing. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good <laughs> But I, I, it sounded like uh, to, to us who worked that, that on this compiler that uh, that was an interesting uh, accomplishment to deal with. Okay, but let's take a look at how this compiler was actually organized then. Uh, this is a picture from the of the original design. It's not readable, but I just show it and I'm, I've made a more readable version of this uh, to give you an idea that everything is starting at the top here with a, with a COBOL source code. We'll, you'll see this a little bit larger in a minute there. And everything filters through here in a number of passes. Now, all the actual passes are not here. Because as we'll see, because we treated this as a data processing system, we had to get keys on things, right? So we split stuff up and give, to give sequence numbers to parts of the COBOL program. So you could then start processing. And then a lot of the passes were actually sorts and merges. You could sort everything to get all the verbs of one type together, right? And then run them through and process them. And then you eventually you then have to merge things back together and get the program back together again in sequential order. So a lot of things. And so this doesn't represent even all the passes, but it represents the major phases, OK? So I think you could get up, up to about 60, 60 actual passes that, that could be run during a, a single compilation. Well, what I've done is to make life easier instead of from this original document, I've, I've taken the trouble to make one which we can hopefully read. <laughs> okay. So we begin here with the COBOL program. And 
phase B is kind of initial phase where we do a lexical analysis of the COBOL program. And I happen to write this lexical analysis. This B1 I did myself, so I know that very well. But actually just split the program up from free format into fixed format and isolated parts, the parts of speech, you might say. We call it the digested problem, <laughs> okay, as the tape that we produce from there. It also produced the uh, a, a somewhat, let's say, cleaned up version if the a pretty printer, I guess, if you would say, <laughs> view of the COBOL program, which could then put it back in, but you could also run that out to print, okay, later on. So from that uh, digested problem, it went into a phase called B2, where we actually assign sequence numbers to different parts of the COBOL program. So you have explicit constants that came out, data descriptions and procedural descriptions from the various different divisions of the, uh, of the COBOL program. From that, we go into uh, phase C, where it split out things into uh, some type of selected statements. These were uh, particularly related to uh, uh, input, output, and environment type statements. But then we have procedural statements and procedural names. So these were split up so we could process names in a particular way. Uh, phase D took these, this data side of this, mostly from the data division. <laughs> and process this, calculated sizes of things, etc., and produce the data names list and a data description des description that went later on. And an environment and file description, which was used for the input output generation. Okay, so that went on to separate tape files. So you can start to see we had to really have a problem getting the number of the number of servos working properly. <laughs> okay. So there was a lot of tape. There was a, your COBOL program was split over several different tapes at the same time, right? So then this comes up here to uh, generating also working storage uh, constants that were there, as well as these descriptions. That was phase D. Phase E, we took these data names, the procedural statements, the procedure names here, and we generated, well, the most important file was this macro instructions, where we then, for each of the verbs, had information about what the data operands were, okay, associated with that thing. We call that a macro instruction at this time. We also produced a jump list for all the go-tos and our implied go-tos, cross-reference listing, uh, implicit procedure constants, and then these selected macros are basically uh, things that we're going to relate it into I.O. commands. Okay, so they go off to another phase called G here. I didn't get everything onto one page, so we now have to take the bottom of this <laughs> and go into the top of this. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, we were up to E. Uh, phase F here took these macro instructions, the jump list, and the data description part, part from here, and actually. Uh, uh, merge these basically so to put them in an order that they would be prepared for that we could start to use that to go into code generation. So this is macro instruction and data description together. And actually at this point in time was the first time you could really detect semantic errors. <laughs> okay? That you hadn't really used the COBOL language properly. <laughs> okay? So quite, quite late in the compilation process actually that you could actually because there you could start to get everything together again, right? And had enough information. Uh, before we could do all syntactical checks. That was done fairly early on, but the semantic errors, this was about the first time you could find out if the program really made any sense. <laughs> okay. Um, and from there, uh, these macro instructions, then those macro instructions went, well, then for F, let me go into G first. These selected macros here were fed into a phase called G, which was the input-output. Uh, we called it actually Tyogo as the name, Tape Input Output Generation and Assembly. And uh, uh, Dick Miner, who was the expert for input output, taught me a lot about that. And I was also working together with the, and I wrote a large part of both the object, uh, or object parts of execution for, for input output, as well as this part of this Tyoga. To tell you some funny stories about testing that in Pittsburgh, but all right, <laughs> that's another thing. Okay. Uh, in any event, these, this, was the, this was the input output generation. This could also generate some constants, but also generated the input output code, which could come into the code generation part here. 
Actually, it was just passed through code generators because all the code was already there. Now, for the rest of the things of non-IO, then we have these macro instructions, and then we come into H1. Now, this H1 is does. <laughs> does does everything. Because this was really the toughest part of the compiler, is getting this code generation to work with 2K <laughs> memory for all the, all the verbs we had to deal with. Uh, so I'm going to treat that separately later on, since I, I did all of that myself. And that's probably a large reason that I spent a year and a half working 80-hour weeks, <laughs> okay, is getting that thing to work. Okay, it was no, no easy task, I'll tell you. Um, but anyhow, inter interestingly enough, these macro instructions, we call the micro instructions, right? <laughs> Strangely enough, that we generate the code from here, as well as constants that come out of here. Uh, then there was a, a phase H2, where we took these constants, explicit constants, and working and uh, I.O. constants coming in here and built a, a pool of constants. Um, and then the J1 phase here was to start to put things together. Here with the working storage part, the programs, the constant pool. Okay? So that, that finally put, could put together the final object program okay, in final executable form. Then we did push that over to J1, where you have your cross-reference list, the original COBOL program in pretty print form, <laughs> if you want to say it that way. And that finally could be merged out and put a record of compilation, and you could print that out on the, on the print offline printer. Okay? So that's, that's the basic structure of the whole compiler, basically. Is the project program supposed to fit in the 2K, or is it uh, no. segmented? It could. If it, if, it, if it did not fit in the 2K, there was a mechanism for segmenting it. But you had to indicate that in your program, okay? There was no automatic part, okay? But it was possible to segment your object program also. It's a good question. Okay. Um, where do I have that? Okay, well, the next part was this uh, does part. Now, <coughs> yeah, here I had it. Since I got that job, that was, that was really, I said, a very tough thing to do. It was not easy to, uh, to deal with that. And, um, but I tried to, to, to find out a way of, of analyzing what I could feel would be the most, to say, frequently used configurations of COBOL statements in the most common cases and tried to then define a mechanism where these generators for those parts could sit in core. So as I passed this macro instruction tape through this, I didn't have to go out and fetch other uh, tape in. But then there was a library of generators for the other cases, which uh, was in this picture uh, before here. Well, we had a library of generators that sat outside here for the cases you couldn't get into here, which was then read into an overlay area and executed from there to generate those cases. Now, we call that does, as I say, because that does does everything. And I think that was really, I really, really learned a lot about programming art, <laughs> okay, and, and how to, to deal with programs and, and structure them and, and deal with this complexity in, in other ways. So. Uh, this is actually original, uh, which I found and I still have, written by myself, July 1st, 1960. <laughs> uh, this was my documentation to describe how the internal, an inter set of internal uh, subroutines which I developed, which I could then call, as, as I was compiling these codes, getting the macro instructions, calling these subroutines, which would provide services okay, in generating the code. So here was the when I needed the load register. There were actually four registers in the Univac, in Univac two. Two of them were the primary registers L and A, and uh, but we had load and unload register A were very typical. This and then we had the thing where I had any type of instruction which I could call and it put together and put it in the output, etc. And then all things there was some shift in the line things when I had to deal with shifting and alignment instructions that had to be generated. Uh, 
And I guess that was kind of my first uh, more or less scientific paper I created. Uh, I created, uh, I still have it actually, I didn't bring it all with me, but I, I tried to deal with a set of generalized algorithms for dealing with shifting alignment of decimal arithmetic, uh, which I, did, I couldn't find any references to anything about how to deal with that in this range. So it's probably a unique paper, <laughs> which has never been published. Uh, about how to deal with the, with the case of, of generalized uh, decimal arithmetic. Um, but uh, that was important in, in getting this thing to work properly. Um, there's some editing service, implied calls that would be generated, uh, containing internal references, constant processors, and this put things out for, for eventual processing for constants, etc. And eventually things came down into this range called cycle output, which is where I actually uh, put out the, the code and collected it into buffers and put it out. So it turned out to be, this was my saving grace, was having this, because this, I think I got this to put in about three or 400 words, okay, of code. So I was able to get a fair amount of the rest of the code generators in there, okay, and, and, uh, and deal with that in a proper way. So it, it turns out, there was a, there was a very convenient, uh, subroutine call mechanism called the R and U instructions uh, that allowed you to, to deal with subroutining. Of course, there was no formal method for parameter passing or things of that variety. Um, and uh, I should also say an interesting aspect, this machine had, of course, had no index registers. So if you're really dealing with vectors, uh, generating code for vectors, you had to generate self-modifying code. And we simulated this by memory locations, which got the name B-boxes. I guess how I remember the D box is that I think that was a carry on from some of the earlier compiler discussions at the uh, at Univac also. This was written in Fomatic? Yes. And after Fomatic compiled it, it was 300, 400 words. Yeah. Wow. All right. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyhow, that's, that was the, the, uh, the idea of DOS. Now, well, we'll actually get to, over to that, that, uh, that topic, is the implementation of Flowmatic. Now, it seems surprising to, to do this, but Grace was very insistent that we write this compiler in Flowmatic. <laughs> okay, now, it was not the easiest thing to do, <laughs> as Don would just make a comment about. And I guess the only time I really got into a fight with Grace was, <laughs> was I introduced the facility into uh, the Flowmatic compiler when it changed the thing, and, and so we could, I introduced two statements called subplex one and subplex two. And these were allowed to put me and creep in one machine instruction or two machine instructions <laughs> at certain critical places. <laughs> so the structure in, in these couple 300 lines was Flowmatic, okay, but occasionally I had to put a few things on in order to make it, make the thing fit, okay. So, uh, so she, I, she found out about this subplex one and subplex two, and I was called into her office <laughs> to explain why I had put in this facility. There was another facility put in X1 code, which was the assembly language. That was a more a larger amount of code, but this was just to, to put in one or two instructions in critical places. So subplex one and subplex two actually survived uh, in the Flowmatic, and people used it after that. Uh, my new, genera new generators in the Flowmatic compiler. Uh, but anyhow, it was through this mechanism I was able to get uh, these uh, subroutines in reasonable size and be able to use them in, in effective form. Uh, I got, uh, uh, after that, Grace admitted that, all right, well, that was okay. Because when we actually came to the demonstrations of this and was running, she said, how the hell did you get all that stuff to run in that? <laughs> in such a, in all that code generation and that thing. She could she really understand how I, I managed to do it. And I, well, then I explained that it, how it worked, et cetera. So, so then we came... From that time on, we had a very interesting professional relationship that she had a really mutual respect for each other for a long period of time. And uh, it was really a challenging thing. And uh, I remember, uh, remember the demonstration days and, and that uh, the, this, was, this was an important part, of course, to have working. Um, okay. I... Um, that's, I think, a little bit about the compiler. I'd just like to give a little epilogue about a certain, uh, maybe a few other aspects of this um, that might be interesting to uh, think about. Um, 
the compiler, as was discussed earlier, was developed concurrently with the COBOL language. It was not easy because uh, we didn't have a little bit of a moving target. This document here came out in April of 1960, which they had worked very hard in the codicil committee to get out. Um, and while during the late 50s and early 60s, where we're developing, developing the compiler, of course, it was our representative, again, Dan Goldstein, came back from these meetings, and we'd have to sit down and say, oh, well, let's all scratch our heads and say, what are we going to have to change in order to get this stuff? The basic structure of the compiler held, so it was mostly the details that, that got changed. Uh, so we were fortunate, but it, did, did, it was not a really uh, easy environment to work in in that regard. And as you said, RCA uh, also developed a COBOL compiler for the 501. And in December 1960, the first time, and this is, I, I will want to make a qualification of this. The first time a COBOL program uh, was both translated and executed in computers of two different manufacturers. Uh, since we sent this out, Doug McElroy has reminded me that uh, Jean, Jean Samet wrote in her book that there uh, was the Philco 2000 Fortran compiler. It was probably working in about April of 1960. And so Fortran programs were being executed on two different manufacturers. Okay, so this might be, should be qualified maybe to say this is the first time a COBOL program or a data processing language program was executed on, on two different compilers. But anyhow, in any, any case, it's certainly a, a historic event. I don't remember the exact date. Do you know? December 6th and 7th. 6th and 7th, yes, because my daughter was born on the 9th. <laughs> okay, 6th and 7th. And Grace was so happy that this thing worked. And when my daughter was born, she came around with a lot of bracelets and some suit that she had knitted herself and gave me as presents to give to my daughter, Catherine, who's now a, a researcher at Brookhaven National Laboratories, if I might say also in molecular biology. Uh, anyhow, uh, about that time, 1961, uh, after we did this work, did you have a comment, Don? Or? It was the same program that was running in both. both That's things. right. You, you guys were cooperating. You weren't competing. In the sense, cooperating with the unit, because in the morning it was run in, in okay. unit, there was two different days, 6th and 7th. On 6th, it was run in, on, in Philadelphia in Univac 2, and the 7th in uh, Cherry Hill. Was the other way Cherry Hill first? OK, 6th and 7th. All right, thank you. Stand corrected. <laughs> That's not too important, I don't think. But yeah, there was, it was really basically say there were some very minor changes, I think, made in the program. I, I do not have data conversion. Yeah, I do not have the copy of the program. Turns out that uh, because of the announcement of this, that Warren Simmons, I think, has indicated that there is some copy of this. So do, if you could get a copy of the source text, I don't remember the source program. I would love to see it again. Of course, I, that time I studied it, but I don't, I don't have it anymore. It would be fun to put into this Annals of History computing article that source program also. Okay. Yes. Do you have any uh, recollection of how long it took to compile yes. a program like that? Yes. I put into my paper a five to eight minutes for a null program, basically. They had a very little part in there. But uh, I think it was a little bit longer. I think probably eight to ten minutes because most of it was tape movement, okay, and getting the, the phases of initialized and things like that required a fair amount of time. So to do a null program was probably in order of eight to ten minutes, I suspect. That's my recollection. Uh, to do anything reasonable was a half an hour or an hour, <laughs> okay? If you had a reasonable sized program, it took quite a while. Uh, if I can add, uh, I think Howard's compiler was a little bit slower. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Deadly accurate. Deadly accurate. But it's something in that, in that uh, direction. Yes, question there. Processing system, and you had all the tape movement. Were you able to do any batch processing and take multiple programs and move them through together no. through the batches, or just a single program had to single go all the way through single the pipeline? Single, single source program was dealt with at the time. Yeah, that's what I did for the students in Berkeley. Uh, I think it's um, interesting that uh, in this time frame, sixty that was December sixty sixty one, uh, Remington ran Univac. Uh, was bought out by Sperry. Um, this was a very bad thing for the automatic programming department at UNIVAC, and I think Howie will tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, it was a time uh, a lot of us 
did a lot of soul searching and said, well, is this the place we really want to be? Because Grace fell into disfavor with her new management uh, at, in, under Sperry. And a lot, number of us have left. Uh, Tom Jones went over to, to RCA to work with Howie. Howie and, the, and Charlie Katz at General Electric in Phoenix tried to recruit me. <laughs> a number of other places. Uh, I happened to wind up at IBM uh, and work for the uh, first several years on the uh, on compiler research and then eventually on the PL1 programming language. And that was the first time I really got to know Professor Knuth <laughs> uh, and at that point in time and did a lot of the work on, I guess you might say that the pointer variable concept in, in high level programming languages is, is my invention. And that was put into PL1 with a lot of comments from both Don and from Doug McElroy during that period of time. Uh, but when I started the compiler, I didn't really lose uh, sight of some of this work mm -hmm. in doing on, the, on the, um, uh, COBOL. So I did spend some of my time trying to study, because I knew some of the problems that we ran with that COBOL compiler was processing data, data, data structures and data descriptions. So I, I tried to sit down and figure out some data structures and algorithms that would be interesting for organizing processing of such things. And, that, that wound up being my first professional publications. Publication, actually, was the use of chain list matrices for the analysis of COBOL data structures, which Don was kind enough to take up as being one of the first papers in multi-link data structures. In volume one of Knuth, you'll find a reference to this paper. Um, and I think that was, uh, there were a few people doing similar things around the same point in time, but I think it was the first publication of algorithms to, to deal with those that type of multi-link data structures, which also gave me a lot of insight as, as to thinking about how to deal with pointers eventually also, <laughs> when I was given the assignment to put that into the PL1 programming language. So um, that's, I think, uh, a little bit of what I, uh, must, most of what I have to say, actually, I think uh, gives you a fair view of things, and I would like maybe to turn over the word to Howie now to continue on unless there's some further questions, but we can continue if, if anything comes to mind later on, we'll come back to it. Howard? Okay, thank you. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm not going to talk about compilers. What I thought I'd talk about is the environment of the times within which all of this kind of work was being done. It was a different world in the late 50s in the computer environment. Most of the things that we were doing, we were doing by seat of the pants. There weren't a lot of tools available. There weren't a lot of uh, people that we could talk to. Certainly no pioneers. My definition, Lynn, of a pioneer, of course, is different from yours. Just an old guy still working. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I would uh, share with you some uh, remembrances that I have about uh, Grace Hopper and put those little anecdotes in the framework of what was going on in the development of COBOL language and compilers and standards at that time. I went to uh, Philadelphia, where Bud worked, with the Navy Department. I was working for them, and we were doing uh, calculations for uh, the reactor that was going into a nuclear submarine. And our subcontractors were Westinghouse, uh, Knoll Atomic Power Lab, and GE's Atomic Power Lab at the time. Well, <clears throat> we had at the Navy at that time, I was working at the David Taylor Model Basin, which is just outside of Washington, DC. And we had a UNIVAC-1, of all things. But that UNIVAC-1 had to serve a lot of different uh, requirements other than this nuclear submarine activity. 
So when we had this uh, responsibility, it was necessary to find computer time. And that, that sounds funny because today it's easy to find computer time. In those days, there was no excess computer time. It just didn't exist. There were only a handful of mainframes around. We were a univac shop. We couldn't go and find a 702 or you know, a card-punching calculator. So we had to find a univac 2 or a univac 1. Rather. And where the devil do you find it? The person in the Navy responsible for our, our activity was a guy by the name of uh, Hyman Rickover, who was, like Grace Hopper, a piece of work. <laughs> and Rickover said to the UNIVAC people, uh, I am sending a team to uh, 19th and Allegheny Exide Battery Factory, <laughs> and I want you to give them computer time because it's important. It's, you know, big stuff. <coughs> The UNIVAC manufacturing facility at that time was on the second floor of this ugly, ugly warehouse. And there were four assembly stations. And as one machine was assembled, it went through two months of testing. When that was finished and it got shipped, they started again and meantime, Another machine from the second station was going through testing and, and so forth. And we were able to take our uh, tapes and uh, programs, and we would be given one of these test machines on the test floor. So instead of being tested for two months, it was only tested for one month, turned over to us. And we were running this installation 24 hours a day, six days a week. And the seventh day, the maintenance people came in although the maintenance people were there all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, as Bud said, these things were water-cooled machines. Uh, they were in an unair-conditioned facility, windows wide open, all kinds of things running in. Uh, the opportunity to run through a program without a, an error not created by the programmers uh, or even the hardware guys was, uh, you know, a, a million to one. Every 10 minutes or so, every six minutes or so, read, write, error, bingo, everything stops. What's the problem? Go over there with literally brushes, air things, you know, <laughs> trying to clear out that head. That, that was the only problem. And of course, the condensation from, you remember that big power supply? the condensation would run off and fill up this little trough around it. And when it would overflow, there was some kind of water sensor, and that would send off an alarm that if, if, if you had a heart pace, pacemaker or so, it would turn that thing off. It was just frightening. And this is the conditions under which we were working. Just a little aside. Uh, in those days, there were electrical engineers technicians, and other people, us. Uh, the EEs did not talk to us, did not speak English, were not from this planet. <laughs> the technicians understood. And they had a job to do. They saw that we had a job to do, and it was OK. So they were very, very helpful. One day. Because of all these read-write errors from all the dirt and dust that was coming in the windows, I decided to buy some suction cups. We had six servos. And I bought 12 suction cups. And I stuck them on with good old spittle onto the back of the, the servo underneath where the tape would pass on its way to and from the, the read-write head with a little bit of pressure on it, very little. And then I put 10, 15 layers of a Kim wipe, which was a, uh, like a Kleenex, but, but no lint on it. And I affixed it on each end with rubber bands. And it virtually eliminated the read right error. <laughs> virtually. Until the engineers came by. <laughs> that was the end of that.
those things had to go off. They weren't the spec. They didn't blah, 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 blah. So they took them off. And we had a, uh, a technician who was really very good and friendly. And he was the guy that told us that we can put them back until he saw one of the engineers come in, and then we had to rip them off. <laughs> so that's how we're working. Now, <clears throat> while all this was going on, <clears throat> we had the phone company. You know, you didn't have cell phones in those days. So the phone company came in, and they hung our phone from the ceiling over the console so at least we could communicate with the outside world. And I had four of them, one over each of the stations, which engineers didn't like that either. But every month we had to move this insulation. And the tapes in those days were metal tapes. They weighed 12 pounds or so. Weighed hundreds of these tapes that we had to move. And of course, you know, the reason they were metal tapes, of course, these engineers had the idea that every so often they would put these metal tapes in a safe and burn the safe and then be able to read the tape. Marvel, I never saw a tape in a safe before. But they had this idea that that's where tapes were kept. You know, it was back up, taken to an nth degree. It was crazy. So it was a major problem <coughs> every uh, month or so to move. Well, now one day, as I was sitting at this little console, a little old lady comes over to me. And she says, uh, what are you doing? And I explained what I was doing. And she says, do you think I could have some computer time? I said, are you mad? <laughs> I said, this is national defense. <laughs> this is important kind of stuff. What do you do? And she told me what she did. And I said, well, that's pretty interesting. And from then on, I gave Grace all the computer time that we could find for her. She was just absolutely marvelous. And said to me, as we became friendly and on a now first name basis, if you ever get tired of the Navy, you can come to work for me. Shortly later after, one of these machines became a Navy property and was shipped down to the Navy. And I went back with the machine and uh, ex tried to explain to them that Machines have some kinds of personalities. Like Bud was saying, you know, these old Univacs didn't like sorting. They hated it. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, if we could organize the work, the processing work that we have in such a way as not put a stress upon these dear little cre <laughs> creatures, that that would be a much more effective and efficient way to run. And uh, they thought that that was really stupid. And might have been. So I then went to work for Grace. Now, in those days, Grace was uh, working on the uh, mathematical compiler, uh, the UNIVAC answer to Fortran. And it was A0, A1, A2, and A3. And uh, at the uh, same time, we started working on something called B0, which was the business compiler, the business language uh, that we all thought was going to be, you know, the, the major emphasis for these mainframe computers. Now, you must realize that in those days, we were operating in a very competitive environment. The competition was a company called IBM. And all the rest of us tried to do things better than IBM before IBM, instead of IBM, whatever. And th this was just the way it was. Uh, when the idea of a common language came up, of course, all of the IBM competitors thought that was a marvelous idea. Obviously, it was a marvelous idea. Here's a way that we could take Big Blue and say, we're just as big as you are. Our color is different, but we're just as good. So the organizational meeting for having this common business language was uh, held down in Washington. And uh, there were about three dozen or more people that came to that organizational meeting. And uh, the interesting part at the time was that I think that there was one university 
attendee. And that also shows what the times were all about. We were not computer scientists. Computer scientists worked for universities. We were computer practitioners, for want of a better name. We didn't know anything about elegance. We knew about bottom line. Damn thing has to run. We got to get it out in such and such a time. The budget is this. Let's not overrun it by more than, you know, 200% or what have you. <laughs> so there was always this unofficial race uh, to get things done. And as I say, not done as a computer scientist would do it today. There were about uh, eight computer manufacturers who participated in the definition of this language. Uh, we knew it had to accommodate what we had a, a feeling was business data processing. Again, we were not business data processors. Uh, I don't think anybody had written a, COBOL, a, uh, a payroll program. Because, you know, payroll to me was business data processing. You know, you multiply hours times rate and, you know, you cut a check. Uh, and payroll in those days was very complex. And it was probably the most prominent of all the business data processing applications. There were 70 some different payrolls that counted at one time, payroll applications. Today there must be 2,000 of them. <clears throat> so we had this idea that uh, business data processing is different from numerical calculations because it didn't use numbers. So what our idea was is we would talk to our customers, our users, most of whom were in the so-called business data processing uh, uh, area, and find out from them what are the operations? What do they do? What kinds of things do they run? And there were very few surprises. You know, they did a lot of comparisons, a lot of reading and writing, you know, very little uh, calculations. So our plan then was to create first a language that would uh, represent the needs of business data processing users. Second, we wanted a language that was understandable. And we said that, well, since our users in the data processing area communicate in a language called English, that would be the most convenient language for us to use to write our specification language in. So COBOL became an English language business data processing language. And finally, we said, wouldn't it also be nice if everybody, all the manufacturers, would be able to translate this language spec into their machine code? So that, you know, if we need computer time, we don't have to stick with our manufacturer and run around like crazy and go to a battery factory in Philadelphia. So those were the ideas that we had, the goals that we had in mind. Now, <clears throat> what we thought was that there would be a, an evolution, that this language was only going to be a language that would exist and survive for a very short time. The organization under whose auspices we were working, a government organization called the Conference on Data Systems Languages, actually created three committees or task groups. We were the short range group because their mentality said, you know, what can these guys do in six months time or something like that? It's only going to be a, uh, an idea, a target, a platform or what have you. And we will have an intermediate range committee and a long range committee. And probably the real lasting work would be done by the, the long range committee after they see, you know, what we have turned out. So our goal was to produce this specification in a short period of time, because if we had gone to the 
powers that be and said, well, you know, we think in two years we could really refine this and it would look neat and, and good and we could, uh, you know, develop something that would last, we would not have been funded, if you will. That would have been the end of it and somebody else would have, would have taken over. So we knew what the parameters were and we set to work doing our thing. Now, while all this is going on, we had two advisors. And these advisors to the committee were people who knew more about what should be done than we knew. And one of the advisors was a fellow by the name of Bob Beamer from IBM. And the other advisor was Grace Hopper from Remington and Univac. Now, mind you that we still felt that we were in this kind of race, this competitive beat them at all costs kind of race. And consequently, what would happen is that every individual manufacturer would bring to the committee those procedures, those verbs, those constants, those formats that would show his or her particular machine in the best light. And we would fight like crazy over these problems. You know, Grace, for example, through her rep, Danny Goldstein, you know, wanted to make certain that we recognize, you know, binary machines. Well, I don't want to recognize binary machines. So, you know, that was one of the little hang-ups that we had. And Beamer wanted something else, and on and on and on. While Bud and his people were working, as is described, and trying to create a system out of these incomplete language specifications, the committee kept on revising them, changing them, refining them. And we would meet every month or six weeks or so, and sometimes come back to our implementation groups with major changes or additions that hadn't been thought of. Now, I approached the 501 compiler development in a slightly different way than the way Bud explained his, in that what I did is I hired a lot of smart guys like Bud to do that work. <laughs> so I was busy doing all the language uh, specification, and these guys were back there sweating out, or, you know, trying to figure out how the hell do we put this into our, you know, compiler design. We, uh, we essentially had the same kind of structure. You know, we had uh, phases that handled each of the divisions and created a meta language uh, from which we could go into a, uh, an assembler or directly to a, uh, a machine code. We had at that time on the drawing boards a uh, uh, specification for a new machine, a 601, which was 10 times the power and, you know, prettier and cheaper and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I wanted to make sure that what we were doing for this machine, that th the reason I created the meta language is because we could then port it over to, to the 601. And of course, they were never able to sell the 601. So there was an extra amount of effort for, for naught. Uh, <clears throat> finally, the uh, specifications were uh, uh, finalized at this time and published, as, uh, as Bud showed you. And everybody uh, raced to produce his interpretation of that COBOL language specification. And uh, it, in a sense, culminated from a uh, political standpoint by our doing a uh, compatibility demonstration to this codicil <coughs> committee, to these executive committee who had no idea what business data processing was, much less, you know, compiler development. But nonetheless, they understood that if you take a program essentially written for this machine and run it on that machine, and take a program run, written for that machine and running on this machine, that's got to be good. <laughs> so indeed, we demonstrated that. Uh, my recollection of uh, compiler time is a little different from yours. My recollection was that it took slightly less than an eternity. <laughs> I remember that during the, uh, the demonstration, what I did is I had each of the 
uh, program managers who are responsible for each of the phases standing at the computer and saying, you know, when this is spinning, what it is doing is such and such. And I said, you know, just speak slowly and long. <laughs> because I don't know when this thing will ever finish. <laughs> and as I recall, it was about an hour, hour and a half. Oh, for yeah, for, for that program. Then, <clears throat> wor working for RCA was uh, a little different than working for Remington Rand. You know, RCA was in the, uh, what they like to call the communications and electronics in entertainment business. You know, color TV was, uh, was the big thing, but they like flash and dash and, and what have you. And our computer center at the time was something like this, nice seats out in front, and then a glass enclosed computer center with curtains. And the curtains operated electrically. So I could stand here at this lectern and push a button and the curtains would part. You know, very, very dramatic. And there's so now we got this compiler through, and we got the listing, and I gave out to everybody, you know, a copy of everything. They hadn't, hadn't the foggiest idea what it was that they were carrying home, <laughs> except that it was heavy and it had their name on it. <laughs> and then I had them all come into the computer room and press a button, because they had survived this compatibility demonstration, and we printed out a little diploma for them suitable for framing, with their name on it and the date and the fact that, you know, that we did that. So, <laughs> as a matter of fact, <laughs> we then the next day went over to Grace's shop and uh, essentially she did the same dog and pony show for the same group, ran through the compiler, Grace explained everything, what was happening through all the phases, and finally got the print out, turned it over to them, and everybody was happy, and off they went. After uh, that demonstration, <coughs> the playing field started to level a little bit, now that everybody was in the business data processing business with the same tool. Everybody had a COBOL compiler, one had a little bit more of this, a little less of that, but basically the core specification was identical throughout all of the interpretations of that language. And you could indeed shift programs around. Uh, the intermediate and long-range committees were sort of disbanded, and a very nice approach to uh, the maintenance of this language was adopted. Uh, what we decided is that we'd like to have the, an idea of uh, upward compatibility. So we had uh, language uh, elements that the committee had uh, discussed and described, defined. And those elements uh, that were going to be put into the next generation of the language were put in something like an on-deck circle so that everybody in the user and development community had an idea of what was coming next uh, so that they can operate in you know a period of relative calm which was novel for, <laughs> for this kind of stuff and uh, then we had to turn our attention to the standardization effort so at that time uh, I left the, uh, the COBOL committee business and started working with the standardization activity. Standardization activity under the uh, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, the Secretariat for Programming Languages was held by the United States uh, in the form of the uh, industrial organization called CBIMA, Computers and Business Equipment Manufacturers Association. And the fellow uh, to my uh, surprise, the kinder word, uh, who was the head guy at the Codiso effort, Charlie Phillips, who was coordinating the work of the development of COBOL, um, moved over to become the head of CBIMA and as a result, the titular head of the standards activity. 
which brings me to the tombstone story. Now, I was working, as I mentioned, for the RCA Corporation. RCA was, you know, a different kind of company. Uh, they were uh, into a lot of different pursuits. And at that time, when uh, you wanted anything done at RCA, it had to have some kind of marketing flavor to it or color TV flavor, which was really hard to produce at that time. <laughs> so um, one day when I was uh, particularly frustrated with a conversation that I had with Charlie Phillips about how slow these decisions were coming and how difficult it was to maintain an implementation group on any kind of schedule and do any kind of meaningful work without these decisions and hanging up the phone on him as I had done 50 times in the past. I left work early and uh, I was driving on the freeway and I saw a, uh, a monument company making tombstones. I said, that's a good idea. Easy off, easy on and off I went and I said to the guy, uh, can you make me a tombstone? He said, <laughs> 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 so he said, what name do you want on it? And I said, Cobalt. <laughs> and he said, what kind of name is that? I said, it's a Polish name. <laughs> so I picked out a, a little, it a, was a white marble, rectangular type thing on a pedestal with a little lamb on the top, which I thought was a nice touch. <laughs> and I paid the guy, and he said, I'll call you when it's done, and I went home. And uh, a couple weeks later, he calls me and he says, Tombstone's ready. I'm still angry. And I went back and I picked it up. I took it home, and I, on the sidewalk, I built a little crate for it. And uh, I shipped it UPS to Charlie Phillips at the <laughs> Pentagon. And uh, very pleased with myself. And I don't hear anything from him. No calls, no nothing. You know, did he get it? That you know, something happened to the truck? You know, or is he playing a mind game with me? <laughs> so finally, I called him. I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, Charlie, did you get anything from me? He said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. I said, well, what do you think? He says, well, I don't know what you meant by that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Grace, in her travels, would, when she would give talks, lectures, what have you, would tell this tombstone story. And people would call me all over the country. People called me and said, what is this tombstone? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I denied that story, denied, denied, denied. Picture of it was on ACM communications cover. It was all over the place. I don't know anything. My hands are clean. <laughs> One day, I uh, get a call from the uh, secretary of the marketing vice president, corporate marketing vice president, RCA, for whom I worked. And that, that tells you something else, where automatic programming department was. And uh, I was asked to come to the executive offices. And uh, I did and waited an appropriate amount of time. And the guy finally ushers me in. And he says to me, uh, someone in uh, Rockefeller Center, New York, has heard that uh, you sent a, a tombstone to someone at the Department of Defense. And uh, they think that this may inhibit our ability to get government contracts. <laughs> <laughs> he said, did, did you do that? I said, I did. He said, would you like to tell me why? I said, no. <laughs> so he said, thank you. And that was it. So I went back to my office, and I got things nice and neat. <laughs> you know, I didn't put them in boxes exactly, but you know, sort of neat, ready, pointing toward the door. And uh, 
I never heard a word from that time on. That was great. And uh, I think to their credit, and that was the end of it. But Grace kept on churning it up with this story. And this is only the second time I've told the story. The first time I told the story was at the Computer Museum in Boston in 86 or something like that, when Grace was there. Well, meantime, Grace, uh, as Bud mentioned, had a little uh, thing with the new management at uh, Sperry. And she decided to leave and go back to her original love, which was the Navy Department. And that was great. And um, at that time, when uh, it was not, yeah, she had a, a problem, and like an angina, but I don't think it was a real heart attack. Yeah. And uh, oh, just to back up for just a second, when I worked for Grace, you know, <clears throat> it, it was unbelievable. I lived just a couple blocks from where Grace did during these days. So I used to pick her up in the morning and bring her home at night. And we would have a problem, some technical issue during the day, and we'd talk about it on the way home. And I said, you know, that's really an interesting problem, you know, and everybody is quite interested in it. And I'm sure, you know, we'll get to that solution. Eight o'clock the next morning when I picked her up, she has it solved. <laughs> And I said, Grace, that's not fair. <laughs> I said, you know, we're all set now. You know, got our sleeves rolled up, and we're going to attack that problem. And you've got it all solved. She said, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> well, now, Grace was back at the Navy Department. <clears throat> and I'm out here in San Francisco trying to eke a meager living out of developing some tools, some software packages, doing this and that. And Grace now is uh, recruiting, finding these sailors that she gets. And she says, with no budget uh, and uh, no particular authority, she started teaching these sailors how to be programmers. And they're producing software packages for the commercial marketplace Identical to what I'm doing. <laughs> Only she's giving them away. Giving them away. Grace, <laughs> you're taking the bread from my children's mouths. <laughs> what do you mean? I said, how can you do this? You are in the Navy. The Navy's job is to sail boats. It is not to make software and to give it away. She said, well, it's not really, you know, giving it away. There's no documentation and, you know. I said, I go around to these big corporations and try and peddle my little wares and they say to me, well, we have one of those. We, we got it from the Navy for nothing. So I said, you must stop. And she says, well, go talk to my boss about this. Uh, the conversation was not as polite as I <laughs> recall to you. And I did indeed go to Washington and I had a meeting with her boss who was a Navy captain. And I said to him, would you like to become an admiral? And I said, you're not going to. <laughs> I said, as I leave here, I'm going to visit my congressman because of what your department is doing. Namely, you are building software and distributing it into the commercial market. And I said, there's certain things that the Navy does not do. One, you don't build battleships. You subcontract that out. Two, you don't build uniforms. You subcontract that out. And three, you don't build software. Well, shortly thereafter, that phase of Grace's activity calmed down a little bit. I don't know whether it was because of her Captain Boss, or because she just got tired of that. But she stopped doing that and moved into what became a major contribution to this whole effort. And that was in the validating of compilers, of COBOL compilers. And this gave the work that she started at the Navy, gave everyone 
computer manufacturers and users an opportunity to be guaranteed that what they were buying, what they were using, what they were betting the, their companies on <coughs> were indeed valid, standardized COBOL compilers. And I think that, that was just a, a super accomplishment. Well, having not spoken to Grace for five years because I was in that SNIT, uh, she was invited by the San Francisco uh, ACM chapter to come out to give a talk, and they called me and said, you know, would I introduce her? And I said, sure. And I called her up and I said, uh, do you forgive me? I still love you, and I'll pick you up at the airport. And I picked her up and gave her a big kiss, and since then everything was fine and dandy. And uh, <coughs> Hatchet was, was then buried, and we became uh, good buddies again. Uh, as I said, Grace was unique in so many ways. Grace, if there was such a thing as a glass ceiling in those days, she would have broken <coughs> it right away. She would never have accepted it, allowed it, considered it, spoken it. That just was not her way. Grace had a, a way of uh, looking at you and knowing what is going to motivate you, what you want to hear, and how she's going to present it. She used to give talks to uh, upper management, executives from banks and insurance companies and all these different kinds of uh, large corporations that had huge inventories of, uh, of COBOL uh, programs but hadn't the foggiest idea where their computer center was. And she would talk to them and tell them what, what microseconds mean. See, she had this, this hunk of wire. Did you ever see that? <laughs> and she used to show it to these guys, you know, the president of U.S. Deal. This is a nanosecond, mister. You know, and it, it, it sounds silly to us. But it really made sense to these people, and they, they got some kind of understanding from her of what the devil was going on, you know, and why they were spending all these millions of dollars every year, you know, to, to uh, support the information uh, technology activities. Uh, the last time I saw Grace was uh, at this Boston Computer Museum uh, shindig, the uh, day before the Navy decommissioned the Constitution, which was uh, the oldest active duty ship in the Navy. And they had her as part of the ceremonies as she was the oldest active duty sailor in the Navy or so. <laughs> and uh, Bud and I were just talking about uh, the fact that the Navy was really a, a major part of Grace's life. and. Uh, she loved it, and she loved uh, all the people that had anything to do with the Navy. And uh, if there were two people or ten people that came to, for a job with her, if one guy had Navy experience, bingo, he's got the job. Uh, apropos of that, uh, just one other little remark. One day, we got a uh, fellow in who was sort of an applicant he wanted to, to come to work. And she says to me, uh, <clears throat> what do you think? And I said, well, this guy is a personal family friend of Press Eckert, who's the vice president at the time. And I said, you know, everything that we do here is going to go right back to Eckert. And she says to me, now you understand. <laughs> That was Grace, and uh, we all miss her. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Great talks. A uh, couple of things. One is we would have had the tombstone here in person, except the tombstone is still in Boston in the Computer Museum behind glass as part of the exhibit. So we couldn't bring it out here. The other thing is that I have copies here, probably enough for all of you, of the paper that Bud is going to submit to the uh, Annals of the History of Computers on the first Univac compiler, and you're welcome to come up and get some. And the third thing is, I think it's September 9th, 
when the hopper is going to be commissioned in San Francisco. And we are trying to organize an event from the Computer History Center. Uh, then we are in contact with the people, and I hope everybody can hear about that so we can really visit Grace and I just add to that that I have sent materials about Grace to the Navy Department, and it's in the hull of that ship. <laughs> they put a time capsule in the hull of that ship. I was actually invited to the uh, launching of the, the hull in, in what's done at the Bath Ironworks in Maine. Uh, and I've sent material for that time capsule. Why don't we take a few questions? I can start it off with one question I have about the test program. How, how big a test program was that? Uh, was it a really good exerciser of the compilers? Did you have it in advance, and how far in advance? And did you tweak your compilers to make sure that you can compile it the way people do these days with benchmark programs? <laughs> Either one of you can answer that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should we come up? Or yeah, why don't you come up? There was only one program to compile, right? <laughs> was that one? <laughs> no, no we, we did, obviously, people did a lot of local testing on their own parts, these own phases, and generated their own inputs and outputs, which was, which was uh, a problem, OK? Uh, but you had to do that. That was the only way to do it. Uh, I remember in this does phase, it re required a lot of my time just generating test cases to try to test out that code generator, which was not very easy. And uh, the, the COBOL program that was actually compiled didn't exercise all the facilities, as I recall. So, but uh, we did spend a lot of time analyzing that particular program. Uh, so, and I, I think that became a, a common a thing, also people doing compilers. I had some good friends at the Burroughs Corporations a few years later were coming with COBOL compilers also. And we, there was a big COBOL program called Big Bird <laughs> that uh, was uh, very famous program that everybody doing COBOL compilers had to, had to manage Big Bird. And this was really a real big challenge uh, that uh, these people talked about. I had, after my experience with COBOL at, uh, at UNIVAC and at the beginning at IBM, I didn't really deal with COBOL so much, and I haven't since then, but, uh, but I hear a lot of stories about it. But testing was, uh, was just done as, as best you could at that point in time. There were no t not a large base of COBOL programs to try. This was. I don't actually know who wrote the, t the, the, you, as a committee, write that program, Howie? You put no, that, no. the test program, who, who wrote the test program? I mean, the, the demonstration program in COBOL. You don't remember? Actually which, wrote it. Which program are you the, the one we compiled on the 6th and 7th. Who actually put that program together? The 6th and 7th of December. Those were you, actual valid user customer programs. Where, where, where did we get them from? One came from uh, US Steel. I think it was Warren Simmons. Oh, ah, OK. And one came from one of our customers. Uh, OK, so we're two programs. OK. Yeah. We, we'll, two different programs. Yeah. I think we had them in advance, so we were able to. We had the programs in advance. So we were working on, on trying to get those to go through our compilers in, in both, <laughs> both cases, obviously. <laughs> First is, uh, uh, were you able to use the unit typer yourself? Uh, the reason I'm asking is that uh, I worked for UNIVAC in the summer of 62, um, and at that time I couldn't, I would have to fill out forms that would have my program on it and, 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 and submit it to, to the, uh, the people there who would, who, who would enter it, and then, then uh, they would give me the thing back and then I could proofread that and give my corrections for the next day. And so it was impossible to write software uh, <laughs> uh, uh, under these circumstances. And I, and I bought my, I mean, this was with cards on another, on Unibac 3, but uh, I mean, you like Solid State. But, uh, but uh, so we had to get a key punch in our apartment uh, so that we could, so that we could prepare the input ourselves uh, uh, to, okay. Uh, but were you allowed to hands-on uh, as you're doing all the software work? Yeah, we did. We had uh, at least two or three unit typers in our department where we could prepare just the, exactly as I showed that uh, picture there. We prepared on the unit typer the code. And, and um, although, you know, it was depending on your typing skills how well you did that. I mean, some people were good at typing. I, I happened to be very lucky at age 16 or 17 had taken a course in typing, so I was quite good at it. <laughs> But uh, some of my colleagues were not as good as that and uh, made a lot of mistakes. So some of the people did actually 
do as you said, put them in forms and gave them to people, and the, some girls typed them up and got them back. Uh, corrections you could make, uh, typically when you go down to the machine, you get on there and suddenly you find there were some problems, you could make some online corrections very early in, in the, uh, on the machine also by keying in. Uh, I, I have one story, my, my, my own maintenance story of the UNIVAC 2 was the, the carriage return command on this online typewriter that we, you saw at the supervising control panel was always not working. So I, there was, we had around these big metal tapes that were 12 pounds each, uh, an elastic band, which I took off and I tied down to one end of the typewriter on the carriage. So it would build up pressure as we were as it was printing across here, and when the carriage returned command, can <laughs> <laughs> it would come back again <laughs> and slam, slam the other way. So that was my that was my one really major repair of the <laughs> of the, of the equipment. Uh, the other story reminded me how when, when Howard was talking about these these twelve pound tapes was when we were dealing with the uh, this t tape input output and generation assembly. We exactly had the same problem that Howie talked about. We had a hard time getting time on the UNIVAC too. <laughs> and there weren't a lot of them around. So we went out to our customers. <laughs> so almost all the, the Tioga work was done in Pittsburgh. And I still remember driving out across the Pennsylvania Turnpike. We were four or five people that went. We, Dick Miner and I, plus two others, one who was helpful with key punching and typing. Uh, Peg Harp, not the Peg Harp, but, uh, his name was Peg, but I don't remember her last name. We went out across the Pennsylvania Turnpike with about 25 tapes in the trunk of this car, which went across the Turnpike this way. <laughs> it, was, it was really, it, they were heavy stuff. You used to get a hernia lifting them up and putting them on the, <laughs> on the uniservo. Done. So when Charlie Katz came to Case, where I was, uh, and told us, uh, he told us that Grace Hopper took took the tape with the mathematic compiler on it every, at night, every night, and, and slept on it to brought it the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the other question I had is, did you ever hear of UNICEF in, in, in Philadelphia? This was an assembly program for UNIVAC that was developed at, uh, in Cleveland. Was this your product? Mel Conway. The, oh, Mel Conway did it. Okay. Um, I just wondered if, if, if it ever got... What, what time frame, do you know? This was 59. UNISAP was for UNIVAC 2? Symbolic Assembly Program, yeah. No, okay. No, I didn't, I don't remember. We, when we did symbolic, either if we we're going to write something in, in machine language, we used X1, which was the normal UNIVAC assembler. But uh, was, how, how high level was uh, UNISAP? It was, it was, uh, it looked like, like FAP, or, you know, I mean, it looked like the, uh, I mean, but the, uh, the people in, uh, in Philadelphia said that the machine language was so mnemonic anyway. Yeah, exactly. The point I made earlier. It was fairly intuitive to learn to program the machine. So, so it's right. Okay. Interesting point, though. I didn't hear that. Yes. With the identical program running on two architectures, this, you know, the first benchmark, if I call it that, does this spur any competition or economic direction by either company? I'll leave that one over to Howie. No, thanks. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there was any, uh, you know, I, I, these guys to me were like mystical people. The name Howard Bromberg and the name Warren Simmons. And, and from my point of view, I would hear through Dan Goldstein and, and about Gene Samet and all these people. So, but uh, as far as the business aspect of whether it spurred further competition between UNIVAC and RCA, I don't know. It was only one competition. IBM. Only one. Okay. <laughs> it was IBM. And everybody IBM else. against RCA. IBM oh, against Honeywell. IBM against GE. Right. IBM against NCR. IBM against Sylvanius. That was it. And we were just struggling to keep our noses a little bit above the water so that we can say, we have now an arsenal as good as what IBM has. Yeah. Even though they have something called commercial translator, PL1 which was a grand idea, we are with the industry standard. That was the message. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so you said that you had to develop COBOL in like a six-month time frame, a short-term time frame. Do you think that that hurt 
your specification of the language, or do you think that you ended up with something that you were happy with? Uh, <clears throat> it hurted uh, in one sense that the uh, specification was not as elegant as it could have been. Uh, it helped in the other sense that uh, there was something out early and you could kick the tires and it worked. So again, you know, it was the conflict of you want to make something nice, right, or do you want to make something elegant and beautiful and something that your grandchildren will be proud of. <laughs> we opted for the former. <laughs> Look at all the trouble we got. <laughs> and nobody's even mentioned year 2000 yet. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Yeah. But it probably also helped it from getting <laughs> overloaded because PL1 was designed to be elegant and had features that were just murder, yeah. even for the, not only for the compiler writers but for the users because of unpredictable behavior for the sake of elegance. Well, yeah. Now, yeah. I wouldn't call PL1 elegant. I will tell you a story about, uh, this is a COBOL lecture, but I'll tell you a PL1 story. <laughs> <laughs> Since I was involved, I, I wasn't involved in the original PL1 specification. Their, their maybe goal was to do that, but it certainly was not elegant. I added the, these uh, pointer variable concepts to the language. But one time when we were, we had a language control board, and all of a sudden there came down a very, very long letter to New York. We were in Manhattan at the time from somebody sitting over on my left here <laughs> that looked at the specifications who thought it was very interesting this new language p01 and the whole letter was stating well on page so and so you state so and so on page so and so you state so and so these seem to be in conflict <laughs> now if you know don canoes you know that that's the type of comments that and he was right on 95% of the cases uh, so we hired him as a consultant <laughs> to help us get the uh, specification better anyhow. But I still don't think I would call it, uh, there, were, there were some concepts which we tried to have some, some degree of, of, of cleanness with. But we turned out uh, the whole storage class mechanism after putting in the, the uh, pointer variable concept was no longer really, it should have been rethought, let's put it that way. And there wasn't time to rethink it. It had been rethought. We could have probably done what you said. <laughs> I was thinking of some of the type conversions. Yeah, exactly, and even those parts. I know you were very, very much into PL1 uh, in those fairly early days. But, yeah. but, but I ignored the type conversions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don?